what they want to do. They want to make a notice, noticeable difference, an impact to a need. Let me see if I can do this correctly. How do I, how do I advance it? Uh, okay, there it is. Okay. Okay, so our agenda, we have a lot to cover. Um, and these slides will be made available if I am not able to cover everything. It is a lot of information. And we have a guest speaker at the end that has a nonprofit that will share her journey. So we're gonna talk about what is a nonprofit, the different types of nonprofit, identifying if the need, you know, the need that you feel needs to be met, aligns with your passion, clarify your purpose and business plan, build your team, determine your board. That is very important. Um, working board and governing board, board versus staff, registering with the state and the IRS, drafting a fundraising plan, set up shop and outline your costs, the compliance, and then the guest speaker. Um, I will ask that if you have any questions, please put them in the chat room so you don't forget them and we'll go over them at the end. And that way I could be able to um, utilize the time to give you all this information. What is a nonprofit? Okay, a nonprofit is, a, is dedicated to a cause, okay? Um, a point of view, something that um, you feel passionate about or a cause that you feel others um, are focused on. It is a non-business entity. And then there's also the not-for-profit organizations like your social clubs, your chambers of commerce. And then there's the nonprofit institution. Um, the IRS gives nonprofits a tax exempt status, so they don't have to um, incur taxes since their goal and focus is on a specific um, need or cause. Um, they're not in it to make money, so that's why they're um, tax exempt. Um, the, the organization, as I said, is focused on a mission, a shared goal, or a cause, and they're, you're not there to make a profit. You do make a profit in nonprofits sometimes, but you put the money back in because nonprofits is business. You have to have operating expenses so you can survive. So you have to make some kind of revenue to survive. It's just that afterwards, your net profit becomes a part of reinvesting back into the nonprofit. Um, can someone mute their mic if, I mean, their um, mic if it's on? Okay, so there are different types of nonprofits. A lot of people, when you say nonprofit, the first thing they think about is a 501c3, but there are not-for-profit organizations like the 501c4, which is your civic um, leagues, your um, social welfare organizations, your homeowners association, and your volunteer companies. There's the labor unions. That's a, that's a nonprofit. Um, chambers of Commerce. Um, a, a social um, Black Lives Matter is a is a is a is a nonprofit. It's a focused group. Okay, child care related um, organizations are nonprofits, and there are many more. Five hundred ones. You go to the IRS, and they will spell out which one you fall under. Okay, so the MPO, the nonprofit, serves goods and to the public or services, and they are charitable organizations. There are two main categories in that 501c3. They're the public charities that um, are supported by general um, funds and, pub and government funds, and their donations are tax deductible. But there's also the public foundations that give grants um, to fulfill a public need. Um, certain, what comes to mind is Shell. They have a nonprofit foundation. You know, the bigger corporations have foundations and that's why you see them giving grants. You probably noticed a lot of them as soon as the pandemic started. Okay, so first thing you have to do when you're thinking about a nonprofit because you say, oh, I wanna start a nonprofit. Um, the one that comes to mind um, that, everybody 
if you're from Houston or a, been here a while, you probably remember Kid Care, the, the, the woman that wanted to make sure that every child had lunch and didn't miss a meal. So she started giving, um, preparing food out of her house and delivering it out of the trunk of her car to kids, kid care. And that was a need. She was meeting a need in the community, okay? So she was also providing a service. Um, and as you see, when it started growing, she received money from the Houston Field Food Bank. She was donated land, kitchen supplies, everything. She had a target group. She had demographics and she met a need, okay? Um, she had to make sure that that was when she probably started, she saw there was no one else doing it. No one else met that need. No one else desired to do it. So she was in a lot, she aligned with um, meeting that need, but also there was um, a vertical and horizontal alignment with the Houston Food Bank, with the Interfaith Ministries, with Meals on Wheels, that they were meeting the need of the seniors, okay, but they were not meeting the need of the children. HISD and all of the school districts were meeting the need of the children when it came to them attending school, but they were not meeting the need of making sure they had food at home. So with that, she, she found a niche, okay, to form her nonprofit, okay? And so what she had to do in order to form a nonprofit going forward was to make sure to evaluate her strengths, what were her weaknesses, where her opportunities was, and where the threats were. And it is a process that you go through. If you do it in the beginning, it saves you time later. Because say you say she started this, and then as she was doing her evaluation, she noticed there is a, a group out there. Let's, let's, let's use another one. Uh, Northwest Assistance Ministry. I was the grant accountant there. What if when they formed it, they decided that they were the only ones, but they found out um, Team Tomball Assistance Ministry was already doing it, okay? So you don't wanna, you don't wanna duplicate, but what they did learn is Tomball had a certain zip code Northwest Assistance Ministry could meet the need of the ones in their zip code area. In doing that, they learn their strengths, the needs of that community, which could be completely different from the needs of the Tomball community. And it's a process you go through. And a lot of times, if you're not familiar with it, it is always good to get a consultant to work with you on that. Oh, sorry. So moving forward, after you decide, okay, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to do. Okay. So now you need to sit down and really clarify your purpose. And the reason you need to clarify your purpose is because it feeds into you working on your mission, your vision, and your values. So to clarify your purpose, start with the question, what my need to... What I want to do, what impact am I I'm, I'm gonna uh, present to the community? What am I gonna do? What is it? What is the end result? For instance, Northwest Assistance Ministry um, need is to meet the needs of homeless um, um, families, single families mostly, um, and to help um, people flee domestic violence, and then from there counseling and growth afterwards, okay? That is their need. They shelter, so they have a huge um, shelter assistance program. They have counseling and they provide a safe haven as the person transitions out of that situation for the family. And so that became their how they impact and then how moving forward that becomes their mission and their vision. So after you get your purpose, what you do is you sit down and write an uh, a business plan. The executive summary comes last because first you need to work on your mission. What is the mission? 
What service or products are you going to provide? What is your vision? And what is the value of your, your values going into it? Okay. That is very important because then it's going to determine the programs that you're going to offer instead of being a catch-all, the services you're going to offer and the impact it will make from those programs and services. And why is that important? We'll talk about that later, but that is important because when you seek funding, there's certain things you will seek funding for and certain things you will leave alone because it doesn't apply to you. You won't make it apply because one grant doesn't fit all. One endowment doesn't fit all. And we will go into that later. After you come up with your program services and impact, then you do your marketing plan. And this is very important because your marketing plan, just like a business, is gonna include your brand, your branding. Like for instance, when you think of Red Cross, the first thing you think of is they come in after a disaster and they provide, they meet the emergency needs of the public right then. That's what you think of with Red Cross. When you think of, um, um, I'm trying to think of the S SPCA. You think of animals being saved, protecting them, okay? Um, so that is their, their, that's because of their marketing plan and their branding. So you have to do the same thing. Your brand has to be able to um, advertise and market your mission your vision and your values all at the same time. So that when people think of you, they think of Northwest Assistance Ministry is sheltering and helping others out of a, 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 a um, domestic violence um, situation. Okay, so after you do that, you have to have an operational plan. And why is that important? Because once you put your um, business plan together, and set up shop, you need to know how to execute it to accomplish the things you want to do. Because in the beginning, it's just you or the group of people that came together to do this. And y'all can't do everything if you want to succeed and have that impact. Always look at the big picture. Because if you stay just in this tunnel vision, you're not going to make the impact you want to make. Operational plan is also going to include your board of directors, your governing board or your working board, as well as your staff. Um, it all plays together, okay? And you're going to need to um, know that because it leads into your financial plan. See, in your operational plan, you're going to have um, information about how you're going to execute doing, providing the services or selling the products. Is it going to take volunteers? or um, paid staff? Who is gonna maintain the financials? Who is going to go out and seek the grants and the, loan, uh, the loans and the um, endowments? Who is going to be the face? All of that plays into it. Am I gonna pay the person that goes out and seeks these things? Am I gonna have an executive director? Is the board gonna run it? That goes into the operational plan. And that operational plan ties into the financial plan. Because just like a business, you are going to have general and administrative costs every month. Bills are going to be due. You, you might start out working in your home. But if you have to get a location, you're going to have to pay monthly um, rent and utilities and everything. If you work out of your home, there's going to be printing costs, advertising costs. There are going to be events that you have to participate in. That's a cost. You're going to have to pay. Even though you have volunteers, there might be some reimbursables that you need to do. There are going to be um, grants and loans that you might go after that are in Austin or in Washington, D.C. That's a cost. Um, also, the cost is to pursue people to be on the board. Dining and, and, and um, networking with them is a cost. So you have to take all of that into account. So from that, you build your team. The nonprofit um, have to have a board of directors, okay? You have to have 
a president, a secretary, and a treasurer. Even if you're the founder, you still have to have a board of directors. And to be an effective nonprofit, it is not wise for you to be all three plus the founder. I know in the beginning, it's just you, but you need to build a team. You need to build a team with someone that has the same interest and sees your passion and your vision. It's gonna come in, it's very important. It's gonna play a key role into how you list it on your articles of incorporation, how you file your 1023 if you decide to become a 501c3 and how you move forward. It's gonna become important when people wanna donate or contribute to this cause. They're gonna to wanna to know this. Your founding members role can be listed so that you don't ever lose that because you founded it, it was your baby, but you still have to build a team. You still have to have a board of directors. Oh, I'm sorry. That's... So moving forward, when you after you build a team, because when you transition from a team to a board, some of the people on the team might have just been there in the beginning, might be there in the beginning, but they already are telling you, when this gets big, I'm stepping away. Okay. And they might later just become a contributor or a volunteer. So you need to transition from the team and you can keep them as your advising team if you want, but you still have to have a board. And on the board, you need to decide, is it going to be a governing board or a working board? Now, the larger you get, you will have two. And sometimes you see, hear people say the executive board and the board. Okay, an executive board is usually the governing board. And the governing board just really oversees your articles, the legality, the finances, the pay staff, and the daily operations. In other words, they oversee the things that keep you out of, out of jail and doing things the right way. And then the working board is the uh, board members, are the board are the members that actually are directors that actually do the work. And in the beginning, when you're a small nonprofit, you usually have a working board. And as you grow, you decide that you're going to have a governing board. Um, I'll give you one example. I am the treasurer and, and bookkeeper uh, for the Tombaugh Farmers Market um, nonprofit. We have just, first we were for a not-for-profit organization. And we have, we're in the process of converting it. We, our papers are with the IRS to a 501c3. And um, we see the need now to have a governing board because in the community of Tombaugh, when we started this 14 years ago as just a not-for-profit, we grew the market from five vendors to 65. And the Tombaugh Chamber of Commerce and the um, manager of Tombaugh and the, and the mayor set us down last year and told us and thanked us for revitalizing Old Town Tomball. And they have plans for us now that we're becoming a nonprofit. They're going to donate the land for us to have a, a, a personal, I mean, our own um, structure. But they also alluded to that they would like to see some prominent members of the community of Tombaugh on our executive board. It works two ways. Us setting up a governing board and tie and 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 and, and, and being in a relationship with the, the, the city of Tombaugh helps us grow. It helps them to have some uh, because they're going to be donating the land, you see where they want they they want to make sure that everything stays legal and that we're following the bylaws because it's the land, it's the city of Tombaugh and you know, the, um, the legalities of it and everything. I don't know that part, as I said, I'm not a, an attorney. So after you decide on your governing board, your working board or both, now you need to look at the board, the board versus the staff. Now I know you're like, when are we gonna get to this being a 501c3? This is very important. And if you do this in the beginning, it will save you time later. Be and this is where this, this is essential to, to really focus on. When, you, when it's your baby, you're the founder, 
you of course want to make protected and make sure you're always going to have a place. And I will be honest, I've seen, even through the Tomball Farmer's Market and through other nonprofits I've been on and I've seen them from inception to fruition, um, the founder decides they want to take on the role as the executive director, which is fine. But then they decide, I want to get paid for this. And they become a non-voting member. You have to really make sure you have an attorney involved so you don't lose your founding rights, for lack of a better term. I've seen executive directors that were the founders after directors of the board do their rotation and rotate out and new ones eventually come in vote the executive director completely out of a paying job and if and once they're off not being paid there and they don't have no voting rights they have no access to the organization they found so you have to really make sure that you have an attorney and things are set up correctly so you don't lose what you created but at the same time, you have a vested interest. And yes, you should get paid for it, but there's a right way and wrong way to do things. Because you have to clearly state the roles and responsibility of the board members, the directors, and staff. And board members, directors cannot get paid. I'll give you an example. I started the Tomball Farmers Market 13 something years ago. I was one of five vendors. When we saw what was going on in the social impact we were doing when we was bringing the farm farmers that um, were not getting um, able to sell all of their produce in a timely manner and the large HEBs and Kroger's and um, in Tomball, Magnolia in this area and how they were able to provide a product to the local community and at the same time um, increase their income, we formed the board. And from there, it started to grow. When we formed the board and decided we were gonna take it to the next level and the city started really evaluating us, the board members had to decide at that time when we were decided we were moving towards a nonprofit, if they were gonna continue as a board member or become a vendor because we were writing the bylaws over again, the articles over again in the bylaws. I decided, that I didn't want to be a vendor anymore because I wanted to see this through. And so I stepped down along with two other people, stepped down from being a vendor so that we did not receive any um, um, monetary compensation. Even though we pay, we would be, at the, be a vendor and we were making money from the public, it still is a gray line. So you have to separate. If you're going to be a board member, director, you cannot get paid. A founder can get paid if they're acting in a staff role, but if you're paid, again, you can't, you don't have a voting right. And that's where you need an attorney so that you're protected. Because when you lose a voting right and you're the founder, it could be major. Okay, so once you do that, you need to register with the state and the IRS, okay? Um, first, you register your nonprofit as a corporation with the state of Texas, okay? And then you incorporate the nonprofit, um, you create articles, you pay the fees, and you prepare the bylaws. When you decide you're gonna be a 501c3, you file your employee identification number with the IRS, then you file your 501c3 with the IRS. Now that might seem sound very simple. It isn't, um, it's a process because before the IRS will issue you a nonprofit, they're gonna review everything and see if you're already operating somewhat in that capacity. And also what are, why are you submitting to be a nonprofit? What are you doing? What are you gonna do? Um, in our case, we, our mission at Tomball Farmers Market is that we promote small business enterprises 
and we go into the schools and teach um, uh, gardening and, and, and I don't know the legal mumbo jumbo, but we educate and, and teach um, gardening and eating correctly and nutrition and all of that stuff. So we're doing that. So now we are, that is why we're seeking um, a, a 501c3. After you do all of that, you review your business plan for financial part. And the financial part is everything we just talked about, but more. You have to determine if you have the funds to do this because there's gonna be a lot of funds you're gonna reach in your pocket or the group's pocket to pay for before you even get funding, okay? And one of the things, one of the things that you need to do when you're considering your funding is, is um, cause it's not a guarantee that you're going to, to uh, receive a, 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 a nonprofit notification right away. Um, so you're paying for, these things might seem small, $25 or 150 you convert, if you're converting your corporation to a nonprofit, um, 275 for the application for the, um, the 501c3, or 600 if it's, um, um, you have to pay the long form. And we just found out um, when we turned in our 501c3 for Tomball, we did it on the easy form under the advice of the CPA that was working with us. And I was telling her because I do the books, I was like, well, our revenue is higher. Our gross revenue is higher than 50,000. And she was like, oh, but you still do the easy form. Well, you know, I was taking her word because she's a CPA. Sure enough, the IRS kicked it back and said, you need to do the long form because your revenue is higher. Now we don't make a profit, but our revenue is higher than that. So I have to go the long process. I didn't call her and tell her I told you so, but you know, um, we're getting a discount on our fees, but you have to pay your attorney, your accountants, your consultants to advise you accordingly. Um, consultants come and play for the passion of the nonprofit when you're writing your business plan and the mission to make sure that you are doing it correctly, okay, for your articles, your corporation and everything and the documentation that you prepare. And also um, they help you with crafting the, the roles and responsibilities if you need them to for the directors, the staff, and even your operations consultants can help you with that. Um, there are costs for recruiting potential members because when you set up your board, you don't wanna make it all family or all friends. You need to bring people to the board. It's a nonprofit. So you need to bring people to the board that um, just like a business that have something they can offer your nonprofit. Maybe it's a connection to um, um, certain endowments. Maybe um, it's a connection to, maybe they know how to write grants. Maybe they have secured grants. Uh, maybe it's a connection in the community. But when you do that, there is a cost involved. Maybe it's dying them. Maybe it's um, sponsoring something of theirs. I don't know, it, but there is a cost involved. So when you consider which, after you do that, you need to consider which fundraising methods work for your nonprofit. And why is that important? Because for instance, in grants, there are restricted funds and non-restricted funds. In grants, you have to, um, if they're restricted funds, you have to use that funding just for that specific program or grant you apply for. If it's unrestricted, you can use it anywhere. Why is that important? Well, most of the time in grants, when I was a grant accountant, most of the grants that came through from Harris County, federal and state, you could only use it for that program and 10% 
or less can go towards general and administrative overhead. What does that mean? Well, you've heard Red Cross say, for every dollar you contribute, only 92 cents goes to the program. So they're saying they take eight cents and that goes to general and administrative expenses. Um, at um, Northwest Assistance Ministry, they took pride in saying for every dollar contributed, um, I think it was 10 cents went to general and administrative um, expenses. General administrative expenses is the rent or the lease, the utilities, the payroll, and everything else. Okay. And so as a grant accountant, and this is where you will, when you get big, pay this person. A grant accountant will take all of these grants, all of these endowments, and all of these contributions every month. They book them. Then they have a spreadsheet of general and administrative overhead. Okay. This is how a lot of nonprofits get shut down. You have to be able to show that a certain percentage of each person in payroll, each light that was turned on and off was paid out of that grant. So what we do is we line up all of the expenses for the month. And then we list all of the um, grants, restricted first, unrestricted, and endowments. And we show how maybe only 0.2% from the, let's just call it the ABC grant, pay for these things. And um, maybe 12% of an unrestricted pay these other things. So for instance, my salary was paid by maybe 12 grants and the rest was um, endowments. Now, I don't know that if I wasn't a grant accountant, I just know that I get a check every two weeks. Why is that important? Because the Harris County, the federal, the state, and the um, endowments um, are allowed to view your records every month. Now, I was always inspected. I always had three or four audits a month. They overlapped. Um, either Harris County came in for the juvenile um, review. Um, uh, the state of Texas might come in and look at the sheltering, sheltered arms review. And what I had to show them literally was I made a packet every month for each one of them. I had to show, have copies of all the, the, the general um, administrative fee bills with the spreadsheet. And I had to have everybody's payroll line. I had to literally go in, but I figured out how to do it on computer and line through everybody's name and, and, and social and just show salaries and then show the percentage of each one of those. Okay, so NAM was considered small. They had a $20 million budget and um, they had 40 employees. And now they're bigger because they have a huge building they built. But that's what I had to do every month with all of the employees and the bills and present that packet. Now, if a grant, some grants actually pay payroll, for instance, the, shelf, the, the social um, services, which was the counseling that NAM provided, requested that they that grant was for three um, counselors specifically for domestic abuse. And that came from the um, flee to flight from after the Chris Brown, Rihanna um, um, incident. Immediately there was a grant from, from the government and from Harris County. And so we had to hire um, three um, counselors. Then um, the Amber one, that's a grant that comes out all the time for pediatric, higher pediatric, uh, pediatric. And so NAM has a pediatric clinic and their goal, yes, is to provide immunization, but their main goal is to check for abuse. And so 
those grants pay for those employees because it specifically says that. Um, unrestricted grants pays everything, okay? And you use it for to fill in where the grants don't cover the general administrator. You also use it for the endowments unless the endowment says we want, like for instance, a, a, a arts branch literacy. If there is a literacy endowment, you have to set up a literacy program. Why is this important? It goes back to your mission, your vision, and your values. Some grants are not for you and you shouldn't try to make them for you because when the funding runs out, which is always a question on the application for the grant or endowment, what are you gonna do if the funding runs out? You have to be able to still show that this project is vital. Now, if you created a project, just so you can get the funding, you're gonna spend more time and pull your resources over there and do a disservice to the other grants. When you stay in your lane, all the grants work together. So from that, you still look at your budget and you say, you know what, I might have a shortfall. So the shortfall that you might have will create an event. You might can, you're, you're, after you grow and you get a little bigger, you might say, I'm going to have one annual fundraising event that will pull in the money. Um, the one that comes to mind is the one you see every year on Channel 13, the Crohn's disease. They have this Distinguished Women's Award. That's their national fundraising event or statewide fundraising event to raise money. But at the same time, they tagged it to um, um, the Distinguished Women's Award. And that's how they get their funding. That's what you do. Girl Scouts, their major event is Girl Scout Cookies. And that's their major event. Keeping all of that in line with your grant helps you, with your endowments help you. Other um, things that help you is volunteers. You, you, might, you chart that on your receivables too, because you have to have matching funds and your matching funds might be the volunteers. Your matching funds might be the endowments. So your matching funds might be your fundraiser. You have to show that in grants, in endowments, in awards. And that's where that comes in. Um, the events, your national and your campaigns. Your campaign can be um, American Heart Association. They have one month, that's their campaign. So you, you have to be able to chart all of that. Campaigns cost money. You gotta make sure that you're not pulling from the money that you already have allocated to programs. You have to keep them separate. Um, as you get bigger, you will bring in someone that will be over your programs and make sure that you keep it separate. Your products and service revenue. A perfect example is NAM. They now have a huge building behind their headquarters. They built with grant and um, endowments that houses their, um, their resale shop, which teaches employment and skills to the um, community there, the underserved community. So it's serving two purposes. Um, it's, um, it's providing a, a place where women that have are transitioning and getting their life back together a skill. And it's also offering something to um, uh, um, a place that they can draw revenue from, from the donations for the resale shop. It all ties together. Um, you can also apply for startup grants. And that's when you have to have someone that really works in that, that that's what they look for. Startup grants that apply to your mission, your vision, your goals. And look for fis um, fiscal sponsors. Um, Shell, or if it applies to your mission, they have so many different programs. Verizon, um, AT&T, 
Exxon. You just have to, it, it's, it's, it's a full-time job looking for that or hire somebody to do that. That's where a consultant comes in if you don't have the resources to hire somebody and keep somebody on payroll. Which way am I going? Uh-oh, I hit the wrong button. I'm sorry. Okay. So after you do that, you set up shop and outline your costs. You review everything, just like a business. How much money do I have coming in every month? How much money do I have leaving? What is my fixed and my variable um, expenses? Um, how much is this program going to cost every month? What is the contingency plan if we don't get the grant next year? What is the contingency plan if we get another grant that creates additional overhead salaries, office? What do we do? That's when you learn sometimes you have to walk away from some grants and um, because it might cost you more than it's worth. I'll give you a perfect example. Um, SBDC, Small Business Development Center, um, is, you know, they're grant funded and they have the opportunity to work with Goldman Sachs um, doing um, the 10,000, I think, businesses, startup or whatever, um, about 10 years ago. So in the beginning, it was great, okay? They were doing that. But when it was time to submit again for the grant, Goldman Sachs um, and HCC created another part. They wanted SBDC to hire two advisors to work with their Goldman Sachs um, um, businesses exclusively and provide housing, which is an office for that uh, business advisor at their, at their location. So that meant that SBDC had to hire somebody if they took this grant and they could only work with clients that HCC and Goldman Sachs sent them. So SBDC said, what, was, what would be the purpose of us hiring them? We're assuming all the liability and costs and it's not benefiting us because an S, that, that, that's saying that SBD's advisor has to say no to anyone else that comes to them that is not under the Goldman Sachs program. So if no clients are sent to them, they're paying somebody to sit in the office eight, eight hours a day for 40 hours a week with little or no um, business sometimes, that's not gonna work. Whereas before, it was like, if they didn't have any Goldman Sachs business owners, then that person could also be used um, to work with other small businesses that was not under the program. And that was a win-win for both because they were, we were getting the money for that, servicing the Goldman Sachs, but at the same time, we had another advisor that could service the Houston, greater Houston um, um, business population. And the other way, it was just not going to work. Um, so they bowed out of that grant. And we can do, and you should do that when it's not going to help you, um, if it's going to change your brand. Okay. Uh, oh, communication, social media, and website. That's a, that's a slippery slope. If you set up how your brand is and follow your mission, vision, and values in the very beginning, you won't have a problem setting up these things. And it's easier if you can find someone that can work with you and maybe barter their services that you can use as volunteer hours to help you. But you don't want to find somebody that they're new at the game. You want to find somebody that knows what they're doing in the nonprofit industry so that you have an effective uh, social media and um, social, oh, that shouldn't have been a comment there, social media and website presence and you communicate your brand. And then after you do all of that, you need to stay compliant with filing your 990, abide by the laws, 
have regular board minutes, meetings, record them, schedule uh, meetings and minutes, pay your taxes on unrelated activities. And that's where a governing board can help you or a paid CPA, an attorney can help you. Um, and keep up with any license and registers um, up to date. And I know it sounds like a lot and I've over probably overwhelmed you a little bit, but if you already have a nonprofit, maybe you saw something in there that will help you to align your nonprofit with some of the things that um, need to be done. So moving forward to apply for grants. When you apply for a grant, or a, um, uh, an award or a, uh, a loan even, these are the things, all of the things I'm talking about, these are the things that all of these organizations look for. These, this is what they wanna see. They don't just go to your website. They're gonna wanna see your numbers. They wanna see your documentation. They're gonna wanna see your books to see if you're following and compliant with it because they're attaching their name to it, especially um, the ones that give you grants from foundations. They really want to see because they're attaching their name and they want to be attached to someone that is running things and they're compliant with all of the things for the government. Uh, let me see if, before we take questions, if um, Shanae is on yet. She, she is, great. Okay, so Shanae, is um, I've seen her grow from a um, starting her her birthday bash box to where she is now, and she, as a matter of fact, she was doing a little bit of work this morning. She had to go get those volunteers that the Junior Achievement started um, assembly line with her birthday um, bash box. But before I um, go into this, is her birthday box, and this is Shanae. And let me tell you, her inside heart is just as beautiful as her outside appearance. Shanae is, um, she is a thriving uh, young, in the young lady, I can say that because I'm older than her, that founded the Birthday Bash Box. Um, and it gives literacy and social emotional learning experiences through birthday celebrations for children because she believes every child should have a birthday. She founded this passion by helping others. Um, she founded this passion for doing this because of that. But she also likes to help other entrepreneurs and share her knowledge through guest lecturing, teaching workshops, and working as a consultant to help others start a nonprofit and for-profit. But her passion, of course, is nonprofit. Prior to teaching and birthday, um, Bash, I'm making sure I get this right. She attended the University of Go Googs, Houston, um, Hilton College, where she focused on event planning and entrepreneurship. She also studied while she was there a nonprofit management for the University of Houston Nonprofit Leadership Alliance. After she graduated, she used her skills to work on fundraising for programming um, in the Houston area. She loves to work with um, individuals about that. When she's not sharing her knowledge in entrepreneurship and celebrating birthdays, she spends time teaching as a chef, teaching cooking classes to children and adults. Um, and she does dinner parties, volunteers at the Junior League of Houston. And lastly, she is in a ladies' Odyssey that venture for Boutique Hotel com um, Company. I met um, Shante Johnson through the SURE program. And also, when I was with SBDC, I helped her set up her books for her nonprofit. And I literally watched her grow from starting out with the dream to getting endorsements and sponsorships from Microsoft from other companies that were just coming in and she needed to know how do I classify these computers or these books or these gifts or, or anything. And I've just watched her grow and she is just really an awesome person. So now I'm going to turn it over to um, Shantae. 
Um, and I'm gonna stop sharing so that she can have the floor. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. I'm Shante Johnson. And thank you, Miss Chris, for inviting me to speak to everyone. I love talking about business. And I love sharing what I've learned, my experiences, that way other people don't have to fall through uh, different pitfalls that I had to go through through to get to where I am today. So anything that I can do to help other people step over those holes, I do it. So I have a few notes here. So if you see me looking here, I'm making sure I hit every point that I wanted to tell you all today. But um, I'm here to talk to you all about how I grew my nonprofit from start to now, and then also some challenges that I've had over the past few years. So the in the beginning, all I knew is that I wanted to celebrate children's birthdays. I um, I didn't know where to begin. My classes in college were all for for profit entities, and I knew that this wasn't quite the same. I knew it wasn't a DBA or an LLC. I knew about the 501c3. I didn't know how to go about getting that, and I spent from 2012, when I first got the idea when I was in school to 2016, compiling things like ideas and knowledge that I would get from here and there. And um, then I realized, oh, I should just call the Secretary of State and the IRS and ask questions. So that's one thing that I always tell everyone, ask questions, do not be afraid to sound like you don't know because you don't know and it's okay ask questions find out the proper places to get your information and ask them as many questions as you need to at one point i felt like the irs would know my name because i was calling them every day several times a day just trying to get clarification on the paperwork that i was filling out as well as the secretary of state because i wanted to make sure that when i did this paperwork I was doing it the right way, but also as a founder of this organization, I wanted to make sure I knew exactly what was happening. I didn't want to uh, give it to someone else because I just like to be able to know. Um, I'm nosy, so I just like to know things. I wanted to know everything about what I was doing. So once I did that, I started business planning. Um, a nonprofit is a business. It's just a different type of entity from a for-profit entity, but it's a business and I needed my business plan. So like I said, in 2012, when I first got the idea, I would save things. Um, I, have, I still have the binder where I would put all of my ideas and they weren't things that, not everything are, were things that I use now, but I didn't want time to go by and the thought that I had or the idea that I had to uh, go away because I forgot and I didn't have it. So anytime I had any idea, anytime I ran across, and I still do this now, anytime I run across anything that I feel like could help my business, I take a picture of it, I save it in that binder or I save it in a folder online. So that's another, some other advice I have for you. Save all of your ideas. Don't rely on your memory unless you just have this awesome memory. <laughs> but save all of your ideas because you never know when you're going to need it. And don't, when you make those notes to yourself, make it as if you will forget and you won't know the context behind what you were thinking when you wrote that down. So write out the complete thought every thought you have around that thought, that way you have it all when you are ready for it. Um, there have been times where I wrote a fragment, a sentence fragment, and I did not know what I was talking about a few years later when I went through that binder. So make sure that you have all of your notes to yourself. Um, another thing that I realized was something that I needed um, and I didn't realize it when I was doing it, but looking back, I'm very thankful 
that I did this was cultivating relationships. People often say, oh, it's who you know, it's who you know. But what I've actually learned is it's who knows you. You can know a lot of people or know of a lot of people, if, but if those people don't know who you are, then when they are in rooms that you may not be able to get into, they can't talk about what you're doing to other people that you may not know. I've gotten so many opportunities for my organization just because someone knew me because I built that relationship. And I reach out to people. I say, hey, how are you? I don't want anything. I'm just, I just thought about you. So I'm just sending you a message to say hello. Or before COVID, I um, would just pop in to people's offices. Now, this was more so when I was at University of Houston. But um, I would just stop by and say hello. I'm a baker. Um, so I would bring them cupcakes or brownies or something. Say, I've been baking in the dorms have some left over, just thought I'd stop by and bring you some. Building those relationships set a solid foundation or part rather of a solid foundation for, for what you are trying to accomplish when it comes to your business. Um, also, I want to tell you all about some challenges that I had. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to ask me questions. I'm an open book. I believe in sharing knowledge. So any questions that you have for me, I'm open to answering. But I also want to tell you about my biggest challenges. So one of my largest challenges was getting volunteers to actually do what I needed them to do. Um, people would want to volunteer and their hearts would be in it. But they, at the end of the day, things weren't the way I explained it. And then I realized the volunteers aren't doing anything wrong. It was me. I realized I did not know how to explain the, the end result and how to get to that end result. So I started telling my volunteers, give me your opinion. If you don't like the way we're doing things, let me know. If you feel like we could um, do something a different way, let me know. So now my volunteers are over in another room in this building that I'm in, and they are very happy with the directions that I've given them because over the past several months, well, I guess it's it's August, so it's been about a year now that I've been working with these volunteers or this group. Um, over the past year, I've asked them for their opinion. I told them, give me all of your opinions, give me all of your suggestions because I need to make this process better for them. I need them and I need them to be happy when they're volunteering. So I needed to set my processes and explain them in a way where they understood and they also felt like they were doing a good job as well. Because if they saw the next time they came that I changed what they did, that doesn't feel so good. So um, I just empowered them. So think about what you're doing when you're working with volunteers. It could be you, just like it was me. And that's okay, but, but it, it teaches you how to change things so that way it can be better for the end result that you are looking to achieve with these volunteers. Another challenge that I had was fundraising. So in the very beginning, everyone was so excited and they were, um, they were giving me money. My family, my friends, people I knew from the university, people that I just randomly met and was talking about birthday bash box to, they um, were excited that I was starting this organization. And my first fundraiser I did in the summer of 2018 for my birthday. And um, we raised, my goal was like $200 or something like that, something pretty small. And we raised about 800 and I was so excited. I did not think we would raise that much, but people were just 
so excited to help me and for what I'm doing. And I was like, okay, well, every time I do a Facebook fundraiser, because this was solely through Facebook fundraising, I was like, okay, so every time I do a Facebook fundraiser, I can expect $800. Nope. I have never raised that amount since. Anytime I've done a Facebook fundraiser, whether it's for my birthday or for whatever else is going on with the organization, I may get a hundred or two hundred dollars, um, but I have never gotten that eight hundred. And I thought, well, what's wrong with me? Why? Why am? Do they not like what I'm doing anymore? Um, I, I just I didn't understand. And then after going through the SURE program and learning about target audiences, my tar target audience for funders was not my friends and family. They weren't my, they weren't the people that I knew growing up or knew from school. I mean, some of them are, but my target audience were people who valued um, certain things that we were doing in the organization. So when you're fundraising, you have to think of it, like I said before, and like I'm sure Ms. Chris has said several times, a nonprofit is a business and you have your target audiences for your different products that you sell when you are having a for-profit entity. So with fundraising, you also have your target audience for funders, just like you have a target audience for volunteers. People who volunteer may love your organization, but they may not give to it. And the same with funders. They may love to give your organization money, but they won't volunteer. You have to know who your target audience is and what they desire when it comes to your organization. And you also have to understand that sometimes it may not be your friends and family. And they'll reshare what you're doing on social media and they'll say, oh, you're doing such a good job, but that's it. And that is perfectly okay. I, I learned that um, it's just my family is not my target audience for this. And the last challenge I want to talk about before um, I answer any questions that you all may have is saying no. There were so many people who said to me, well, you're doing birthday boxes. Why don't you do boxes for the elderly for their birthdays? Or why don't you do graduation boxes? Or why don't you sell your boxes? You could put more stuff in there and sell them. And one, starting a nonprofit is a lot. I'm like, it, it's a lot. And you have to stick with your mission. I love the elderly and I love when people graduate from whatever they were trying to accomplish. When they reach their goals, I'm extremely happy for them, but that doesn't align with what I've created for this organization. And so I had to learn to tell people that's a great idea, but that's not something that I can accomplish through this organization, because one, on my paperwork with the Secretary of State, I told them I'm only celebrating birthdays. So if I do something out of the scope of my mission, that wouldn't be so great. But I need to basically stay in line with what I'm doing. You can't, um, or you shouldn't, tie yourself to too many things in your mission just because the opportunity is there. The opportunity may not be for you. It may be for someone else. And you have to discern what's for you and what's not for you and respect it, res respectably tell people, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Um, people will try to give you things that you don't need for your organization. I had someone give me some shoes for a man well, my organization serves children. I don't need a size 12 running shoe because the children would never fit that until, well, as a child, they wouldn't fit it. And so I have to turn down that donation. You may get other things. You may get art or just anything that you may not need. And you have to, people, some people think, well, it's a nonprofit, they'll take anything, but you have to be very clear on what works for you 
and what doesn't work for you and be okay with saying, I'm sorry, but I can't take that. And maybe suggesting that they give it to another organization that you may know, maybe Salvation Army or whoever else has a nonprofit that you may know. Um, so yeah, those are the challenges and the things that I've gone through with starting and um, and just sustaining this organization over the past few years. So um, there's a whole lot more that I could tell. Like I said, I'm an open book and I like to share information. So if you have any question, feel free to ask. I am here to answer whatever you have. First of all, Thank you so much for coming. Um, you're a busy person and <laughs> I just always appreciate your kind and pleasant spirit. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, Thank and you. Be before you ask the question, let me show y'all her birthday box because she didn't even plug herself. See how she is? <laughs> but let me show you her birthday box. Let me see if I can do this right. I pulled it up on Facebook. So let me see. Can y'all see that? Can everybody see it? I hope so. That is what a child receives when they, they um, um, get a birthday box from her. Okay, let me stop sharing. Did y'all see that? Anybody? Did you see it, Shante? I did. Okay, good. So then they saw it. <laughs> I need to turn it off now. Let me see. Okay, so let's y'all don't be shy with the questions. Anybody? Y'all can take it off mute and jump in. Yeah, nonprofits are one of the the topics that I rarely see talked about. And people often have questions and or Miss Chris, if you have anything that you think that they may need to know that you want to talk about, we can do that as well. I just well, I like to share about nonprofits because the information is not as available as it right. is for for-profit entities. Oh, one thing I just thought about uh, with saying that, um, another thing with having a nonprofit is also knowing how to speak, I guess, like the language of business mm -hmm. because you're going to be talking to corporations, whether you want them to volunteer or want them to donate money or just want them to get involved in different types of ways. And corporations, typically people who are on the for-profit side do not understand nonprofit. Right. So you have to be able to know the nonprofit language and different keywords and terms for things, but also know how to translate that for someone who does not know nonprofit. Like yes. people often say, well, nonprofits don't make money. It's in the name nonprofit. You have to have, make that into a learning moment where it's like, it just, it means that we do things with our money differently than a for-profit entity. It, does, it means that at the end of the day, we're not looking to put money in our pockets. We're doing something for the community, but you can still make money. You have the United Ways out there, the Red Crosses, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, these huge multi-million dollar organizations. You know, the people who work there don't take home hundreds of thousands of dollars typically, but you still make money, you still get paid and people think that you, it's not that way. So yeah. one of the things you shared that I thought was so awesome is that your volunteers, you treat them as you would an employee mm -hmm. of your business because they have a vested interest because they bought into your passion and your mission. And so you do that. And without you even saying it, you did say that you, sh you, you invest in them as well as them investing in your passion. And the great thing about that is you never know out of those volunteers who they're connected to that mm -hmm. might be able to help you in other ways than instead of volunteering in monetary ways, just mm -hmm. by them buying into your passion. Because if they're passionate about it after you buy into them, they're going to go share it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so then next thing you know, it, you have others wanting to either participate in volunteering or give to you. I like that. 
you know, that you shared that. Yeah, they, um, I want them to have a different type of volunteering experience. Uh -huh. You know, I, I, it's, it's fun because we're putting together things for birthday parties, but I want them to experience something different with me that they don't get anywhere else, which is why I value their opinion. Or I even sometimes surprise them and say, oh, hey, uh, we have, I have some birthday snacks for you today. So like even like these things here, these are birthday flavored pretzels. <laughs> I bought these and every once in a while I'll give them to them. Or there's a lady that I'm connected with out in um, Toronto in Canada who makes birthday cakes in a cup where you put the ingredients in the cup and put it in the microwave and it makes the cake. There's icing and candles and sprinkles and everything in the pack. Today, I gave my lead volunteer that. I was like, well, you know, thank you for coming. And here's a little gift for you. You don't have to give gifts every time, but people have different love languages. And if we're, if I'm not really close with them, I may not know. So I need to make sure I'm hitting on all of those love languages. So that way I give them a little feel good feeling when they come to volunteer with me. They don't expect to get something every time they volunteer, but it's just a nice little something. Yeah. One one of the things um, you haven't done, and, and 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 I'm gonna work with you later on that. But let's plug birthday bash box. What what was your your vision, your value, your mission? What impacted you? How did this all come about? Tell us about birthday so, bash box. Birthday bash box actually started from a conversation that I had with my mother when I was in college. Um, we were talking about my own birthday parties. I'm the first grandchild in my family on my mother's side, and I'm one of the oldest grandchildren on my father's side. And so, uh, well, one of the first on my father's side. So, um, and my family's huge. Like I know all of my cousins. I know which ones are first cousins, but second and on, I have no idea. I just know that they're my family. And so, we would have these huge birthday parties. And I remember being a small child, having all of these people around for my birthday. And my mom told me that there was always a girl there every year who seemed really sad. She said she wouldn't really play games. She would sit off in the corner of the yard by herself, by a tree. Um, she just wasn't really involved. She'd be there every year, but she wasn't involved. And um, when we were older, my mom found out that it was also her birthday and we have the same birthday and she had never had a birthday party. It's just every year she was at mine. So I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I knew I wanted to, along with my for-profit businesses, have a nonprofit as well. I thought I was going to do a food bank, but after that conversation with my mother, that solidified it. I was like, okay, I'm doing birthday parties, but I didn't want it to be just birthday parties. Um, I have a lot of educators in my family. My mother's an educator, my aunts are teachers, my godmother's a principal. Like I just, I, I grew up in education. So I wanted to give the children something that would celebrate them that day, but give them excitement around education as well and give them something that could last more than just that one day, hopefully. So that's where I incorporated social emotional learning into our games. We did that in the beginning where we were doing in-person celebrations. These birthday boxes were something that we did in 2020 and it just took off. We weren't doing boxes yet. Um, we were doing in-person celebrations and all of our games were around social emotional learning. If you can imagine, we did seven parties a day with one school celebrating every child in the school who had a birthday that month. We would go out once a month and it'd be a cafeteria full of children playing games that we were leading on stage. And um, so the games were around social emotional learning. We would talk about the different aspects of social emotional learning and go into like um, with Sleepy Bunny, that was one of the games we played. The children would pretend to be an animal, whatever animal we said, and 
after the game, we would talk about why it's okay for people, for animals to be different, why it's okay for people to be different and respecting people who are different from you, things like that. So our games meant something. And then um, with the books we give out, they would choose their own books at the school. Now with the boxes, we give them books that go along with their interests. So we don't have the children here to say, oh, I like that book or that book, but their parents fill out an application that tells us what they like. So the volunteers are in the room putting books in the boxes where like if a child likes unicorns and they get unicorn books, or if they like um, dinosaurs, they get dinosaur books. We also try our best to include books that have main characters that look like the child. We want them to see themselves. So our boxes are not just about birthdays. Like it's it's a, an experience that I want the child to have that they may not realize that they're having just by getting our birthday boxes. Um, so yeah, that's how we came to be. And also in 20, so when we started, we weren't going to celebrate uh, the entire school. We were only celebrating about 30 to 45 children. We ended up celebrating 654. Oh my God. First year. Yeah, it was a lot. And that was 2019. Yes. And then in 2020, January of 2020, we were sitting here in this building at the board meeting and I told the board, okay, let's try birthday boxes. Let's do one a month. We'll do 12. We'll see how it works out tweak things as we need to. And then in 2021, we'll go full blown into birthday boxes. I said, but however, we don't know how 2020 is going to come, how, you know, what's going to happen in 2020. We didn't really know about COVID just yet. It was the beginning of January. And I said, you know, last year we were only going to do about 35 children for the in-person celebrations. And we did 654. So we're thinking about doing 12 for this year, we never know how many we're going to actually do. Let's just see what happens. But we're aiming for 12 just to test it out. We did 250 by the end of 2020 because we could no longer do in-person celebrations and people started reaching out for birthday boxes. We started getting more sponsorship and more, um, just so many companies supporting us like Kendra Scott and Microsoft. Microsoft gave us computers. And so it was just a lot, it was it, the whole year was a blessing for our organization and what we were trying to do to serve the community. So we grew faster than what I anticipated, but um, it has all been, it's been overwhelming to be honest, but it's been great. And oh. I would just say to all of you, when you are starting your organization, please create a business plan because I do not know what I would have done for 2020 had I not created that 32 page business plan in the SURE program in fall of 2019. So yeah, create your I, business plan. I know Ron probably wants to wrap this up because we're coming to an end, but I have two questions for you. One is, what is in your business, your birthday bash box? And I know you said books and, um, you know, the, the cake and all that, but just uh, the description of the items you put in it. And two, your your board. Is it a, who's on your board? Is it a governing board, a working board? But um, I know you might can't give names, but who's on your, you know, general? So my board um, is actually made up of my friends. And I... I, can you still see me? Up? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, so my board is made up of my friends and I tell everyone don't do that. I just have friends who are subject matter experts at so many things that I don't know. So my president works for, she's a secretary, is it secretary? She's basically chief, oh, chief of staff for District F. And my, I have like just, they, they just know things that I don't know. I was just fortunate to have these people as my best friends. Not all of them, like even my secretary on the board works for the CDC and has been on the coronavirus task force. And um, my treasurer is a math teacher and just they have varying levels of knowledge that I just don't have. 
And um, so, and they, they, yeah, that's basically it. They're just that's people. That you still have a real rounded board though. You have mm -hmm. CDC, you have someone in the community, you mm -hmm. have a math teacher, uh, mm -hmm. which is an educator. I mean, so even though they're friends, you just were blessed that you're surrounded by people mm -hmm. that have those things. So that's great. Mm -hmm. So what's in your box? So in the boxes are, there's a lot. Um, there's gifts for the children. They get about two or three gifts, um, large gifts. Um, we do put smaller gifts in there. So they'll get like bubbles or a happy birthday necklace. Um, they get what I call party packs. So it's plates, napkins, uh, a birthday banner, cups, those types of things. They get candles. I try to give them things that you can't find in the store. So we get like those fancy wax candles that you find. Like if you go to Crave Cupcake, those are in the boxes. They get a cake mix, they get icing and a cake pan. However, we have partnered with another organization that celebrates birthdays here in Houston that solely gives cake. So if you look on our social media, on our Instagram and Facebook, you'll see cake. I didn't make those cakes. I'm a baker, but I did not make those cakes. Um, those cakes come from that organization. We just give them the child's information. They make the cake and deliver it. So that, I guess, comes in the box, but it's not actually in the box. Um, they get, what else? Balloon, but they get balloons, balloon garlands. Um, they get all different types of things to celebrate their birthdays. Um, it's It varies. Everything is tailored to the child. So no two boxes are the same. Even when we have partnerships with Kendra Scott, the jewelry store, we put jewelry in the boxes. So sometimes oh. the child may get like a $55, $60 necklace or bracelet. How old are these kids? These kids are between the ages of three and 11. <laughs> okay, so if I just add my age together, I might, and I can be one of those ones for the Kendra Scott, okay? <laughs> yeah, Kendra Scott supports us a lot. And so they put jewelry in the boxes. Um, we put sports balls in the boxes, you know, regular size basketballs, footballs, just whatever the child likes. I try to give them cool things and technology and Bluetooth speakers and just different types of stuff. So yeah, they get a lot in those boxes. Ooh. And the well, boxes are pretty large too, so. Oh my goodness. Well, listen, does anybody have any questions or do they just wanna come on and just thank Shantae for joining us? Don't all unmute at once. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get a reaction? Like, can you do something? I need to know y'all still there. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. I, yes, this has been great. I love, I love the way you explained your journey. Um, I just recently started my nonprofit. It was, it was, um, it's a 5013C. And I'm glad that you guys are having this meeting because. It was approved by the Secretary of State, <laughs> but now I'm trying to figure out everything that I need to do. And I just received some information from them about the 990. And it was saying that I can do an easy form. So it seems like it's pretty easy because I haven't made any money yet. Yeah, it's so easy. I'm to file that. So the question is, can I just do the easy form with the 990 uh, that they're asking me to file each, you know, for this year? Yes. So you are supposed to file your 990. That's your taxes every year. And the easy form is so easy. It's yes. like you go online on the IRS's website. You, I think there's a question that says, did you raise over $50,000? You check no. And then maybe put your name and information about your organization and then you're done. Yeah. Okay, great. Super easy. If you have questions about that, call the IRS, ask them as many questions. If you don't get a good answer, hang up, call them back. Somebody else will answer and they may be better at explaining things. So 
just call the IRS. But yes, it is extremely easy. Okay. Yes. I was worried about that. I was like, I don't want to get flagged for that. Okay. Yes. And, 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 and also do it um, even if you don't make anything because that form will, if you don't turn it in, you will get flagged as not being compliant. Mm -hmm. And that blocks so many things um, because before a, a foundation will contribute to you, they look you up. Mm -hmm. And if you're not compliant, they're not going to contribute to you because they can't, it's not tax deductible for them. That's why. Okay. Another thing, uh, will this, I asked a question in the chat, will this Zoom be available after the meeting? I'm trying to write everything down, but. <laughs> yes, yes it will. The PowerPoint too. Oh, awesome. Okay. Well, we're at our time. So before Brother uh, um, Deacon Downs comes on and closes out in prayer, please, y'all, join me in thanking Shante for coming and speaking with us. Um, and feel free to look at the PowerPoint and just look her up, too. She's on Facebook. Um, recommend her to somebody that you know might need it. I mean, just let's just let's support this sister. She's, you know, just a young, beautiful, um, glowing inside and out. And her passion for what she's doing is just awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Chris. Oh, uh, how did it go, guys? Everybody have a, everybody get anything good out of this meeting? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think everything went well. Um, you had the question and answer period. I've been away from the phone for a bit. So have we concluded? All the questions yes. have been answered? Yes. So that's, that's really good. Well, let us close out so I know people have things to do. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that in thanks to you, God, for allowing us to have this session this morning, for all the great information that was, that was passed around and was disseminated to us, dear Lord. May we take this information in. May you use us to help this information if anybody can gain from this and can put it into practice, dear Lord, using the principles that you have taught us, dear Lord, so that we can do things in service so that you get the glory from all our endeavors. This is our prayer this day. We wanna thank for our guests. We wanna thank those who helped put this thing together. And may we continue to work on with all the challenges that we have. We wanna pray for the school children this morning, dear Lord, as they start, as, as, this, as the school year starts with all the challenges that we have with the virus and other things. Help us, dear Lord, help us do the things that you would have us to do. These and other blessings we ask in your son's most holy and precious name, amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, bye. Bye-bye now. Bye. Oh, yeah, close it out.